Okay, well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I wanna welcome you on behalf of the University of Florida IFAS Extension Polk County. Welcome to Growing Seminole Pumpkins this evening. Just have a few things I wanna mention before Carol gets started with the program. Uh, we, we appreciate your participation this evening. The University of Florida is an equal opportunity institution. We strive to reach a diverse audience. However, if you feel as though you've been discriminated against at any of our programs, please feel free to file a complaint with the USDA. You can fill out the form on their website. You can give them a call or write a letter addressed to the USDA, but we do appreciate your participation. And just a little bit about extension, a little background. So we're with the University of Florida IFAS Extension, Polk County. And so maybe you've heard of extension, maybe you haven't, but extension is a partnership between federal, state and local government. And so we have our local extension office in Polk County and we provide research-based information to the public. So main campus is there in Gainesville. And then locally here in Polk County, we have tons of information um, that's from researchers, throughout the state. And so we have information on 4-H for youth, livestock, composting, Florida-friendly landscaping, master gardener volunteer program, lots of information. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to your local extension office. And now I'm gonna pass it on to Carol. Good evening, and I wanna welcome everybody and thank you for choosing to spend your time here this evening with us. Uh, my name is Carol Leffler. I'm a U.S. IFAS Polk Extension Master Gardener Volunteer, and I have been volunteering since 2005. Tonight, we're going to talk about Seminole pumpkins. Um, it's a topic near and dear to my heart. I love growing them. They're a lot of fun. Um, tonight, the topics we're going to cover, and this is a new updated program from, last, from the first one that I did last October, we're gonna talk the his, about the history and the varieties, why grow Seminole pumpkins, the propagation and growth requirements, landscape placement, what I call the three Ps of pumpkins, pollination, pests, and practices, recognizing pests and beneficial insects. And then we're gonna go into the kitchen, talk about the nutrition and uses of Seminole pumpkins. And last, but not least, because it's very important to your success in growing Seminole pumpkins, we're gonna talk about keeping records. So the Seminole pumpkin is, was traditionally grown by the Calusa, the Creek, and the Miccosukee people. Seminole pumpkins remain one of the tastiest and most reliable pumpkins for Florida gardens. Aboriginal Floridians sliced and dried the fruit You'll, you will see, and um, this is very prevalent when you see pictures of Seminole picture, uh, pumpkins, that the sizes and shapes vary as they may cross pollinate with butternut or other similar squashes. And also the shapes can vary um, because sometimes if a pumpkin is a little bit elevated, it's gonna have a pulled, a pulled out shape on the top. So there's all kinds of uh, interesting variations that you'll see. Because it's an open pollinated cultivar and it's very tolerant of heat and humidity, disease, and it's also uh, insect resistant as well as disease resistant. So it, it's a great addition to your garden. It's nutritious with a high shelf storage quality, the storage of two to 12 months. You can test this for yourself when you uh, grow a few and just set one on the counter and, and watch it over the months. So the first question that always comes up is, is this a traditional vegetable or is it a native? A lot of people think it's a native. So this is um, information from the Atlas of Florida plants. And historically the Seminole pumpkin and pumpkins in general come from South America. Also the Seminole pumpkin, um, was migrated and cultivated by um, uh, early South American and Mexican um, um, peoples and brought up through, um, through the Southern United States and brought also to the, the native populations in Florida. So the answer is that it is not native. Um, it is not, there are native, um, 
uh, vouchered plant specimens now, wild populations in Florida that are represented by the green on the map that you see. But the, but the plant, even though it has native tendencies and thrives in our environment, it is, was not native to Florida originally. So <laughs> why grow seminal pumpkins? Um, this is a great picture of the seeds. Um, they are plentiful. Once you have a pumpkin, you will have seeds uh, for some time to come. But we grow some seminal pumpkins for food, uh, for the seeds, for the healthy plants that can be attractive ground cover. And they're just plain fun to watch. Uh, they have a rambling habit. And when they get out of their bounds, all you have to do is uh, discipline them like an unruly child and pick up the end and redirect their activity. So when to plant in Central Florida? There are two basic seasons in Central Florida. Um, and they run March through July. You see on the infographic that the seminal pumpkin is listed as beginning to be planted in March and all the way through to July, they can be started. They can also be successfully planted in the fall 120 days before your first frost. However, um, you just have to watch, watch the weather, but it's very, um, it's usually successful. You wanna direct seed, seed them or transplant with care. So um, these are the general care guidelines and the picture is a germination test that was done between damp, damp paper toweling and every single one of these seeds germinated in two days. And that's just kind of phenomenal because there's a lot of different vegetable seeds that take longer than that. Um, so you wanna direct seed them. They love to be direct seeded. Um, we can talk about other options in a sunny area with six to eight hours a day. The vines may grow up to 30 feet and you may mulch them lightly. Um, you wanna plant seeds a half to an inch deep. And as you see there, the literature says that germination is in seven to 10 days. Of course, if they're direct seeded, that depends on um, the water available, either, either water, water you uh, water the garden with or with rain. Uh, you need to provide regular water if rain is absent, and drought can definitely affect the fruit size and set. The plants are not too fussy about the soil composition because they grow as a native. Um, they have native tendencies. They are not picky about enriched soil. In fact, excessive nitrogen can deter the fruit set, and it will also, and even though you'll get dense green foliage, that tender green growth attracts insects to feed. So practice also and become aware of proper crop rotation and soil solarization guidelines to avoid the soil buildup of nematodes and pathogens. And once again, I write, keep records because you need to have a place where you're going to keep a record of this crop as you go so that you can write when you started it, where you got the seeds, any inputs that you made, and the progress and problems as you go. It'll be very helpful to you along the way. <clears throat> so this is uh, the green seed leaves appear appearing at five days. And you can see that they really, really have a nice root structure already. So these were then taken and put in starter pots. And there are a number of ways that, and places in the landscape that you can grow your, gar your seminal pumpkins. One in the starter pots. Two, we're gonna talk about um, those that come up in the compost pile as um, sometimes a planned surprise. Um, in the vegetable garden, in mixed edible and ornamental beds and fences and pathways. So here's a transplant method. Um, they don't really wanna stay in the pot very long. They want to be in the ground because they have substantial shallow root systems and that vine travels putting down roots at every leaf node. You only need two or three plants to grow an astounding 
uh, amount of pumpkins in one season. So don't feel that if you have six seeds that you need to plant all six seeds, um, plant three, see how, see how it's going, only replace if you need to because um, these are very large and traveling vines. Um, and also I'll make a, make a point here, when you're starting out gardening and <clears throat> all along gardening, you want to um, have materials to use to put your pots in and so forth. And always think of ways to recycle other plastic materials, um, especially now when we're not going to be recycling in Boat County. So it, in the near future. So these are um, sandwich um, covers from, um, from deli, deli foods and they're just super. So this is grown in the compost pile. Um, they come up in the spring and it's the right time, right place. They come up when it's the right time, when the, the weather is warm, when the rain has begun, when, and they're enriched. And you can see that these are quite green and lush. Um, and you might want to reduce the number of them that are back there. But this is an example really of right plant, right place, because it really is taking care of itself and providing um, a weed prevention while they're starting up. You wanna choose a few and move or share them or just thin them out. So um, the leaf modeling that you see, a lot of people will think, well, that's downy mildew. It is not. It is a characteristic leaf um, um, visual appeal that you will see of the Seminole pumpkin leaves. They're really quite pretty. And it's, it's a very healthy um, plant. So in the vegetable garden, this is uh, where the, <laughs> the, the Seminole pumpkin, and you can see a pumpkin right down in here. I just kind of gave it its head and redirected to where it's allowed to be. There's some back here along the walkway. Um, they're really kind of fun. In a mixed ornamental bed. This is a planting from a couple falls ago that I did not plant that there. Uh, some animal or bird transferred the seed, planted them at the corner uh, unintentionally, and these vines, two of them, traveled all the way across the front bed and all the way back the side bed and really um, produced tens of pumpkins. They're a lot of fun to watch. The advantage to planting them in a mixed bed is that the pollinators are already there uh, foraging the ornamentals and that increases the chance for pollination. So, and I already um, alluded to along fences and pathways, and this is a great place to let them grow because most likely you are not using that space anyway, and they are deterring weeds and um, uh, shading out what's below them. So pollination is probably the one topic that gets the most discussion among new gardeners. Um, seminal pumpkin plants produce separate male and female flowers, and they open in the morning hours and then close typically by noon. Um, so if you want to scout and see your flowers and try to identify what's going on in the garden, you want to be out in the early morning. The male flowers are the first to open, appearing a week before the female flowers generally. Pollen from the male flower must be transported to the female flower, and that is principally um, done by honeybees. Other insects, including solitary bees, assist in pollination, and the presence of bees affects the choice of your pest control products. So the flower structures, the external structures of the male and female flower differ as shown at right. On the top, you'll see the male flower. At the bottom, you'll see the female flower. The male has the calyx or green structure of very visible sepals. You'll see those here. And the female has an immature swelling, which is the ovary. It is not a pumpkin. It is the unfertilized 
ovary that is seen at the base of the female, female flower. And when that is pollinated um, and fertilized and fertilization occurs, then and only then does this become a juvenile pumpkin. So here's the male flower interior structure. A single stamen at the center of the flower holds pollen to pollinate and fertilize the female blooms. Um, there's these two bees are green metallic bees. They're really shiny and uh, kind of fun to watch. They are gathering pollen while foraging for nectar. They're there for the nectar. They're just picking up the pollen uh, incidentally. And the male flowers produce both pollen and nectar. And that's important because the nectar, the pollen, the nectar pulls them in and the pollen is what they leave with other than a meal. So the female flower structure is, and you can see this is, this is a lobed structure. It's a much bigger structure. Uh, it's a collection of stigmas seen in the center and the female flower only produces nectar. In fact, it produces it in higher quantities than the male flower because that's a huge draw to insects. So the pollen must be transported by bees and other flying insects. Bees visit the female flower to drink the nectar, depositing pollen connect collected on the male flower onto the female flower stigmas, which is this structure in the middle. When the female flower closes, the opportunity for pollination is over. Hand pollination is always an option. I have never had to pollinate a single, hand pollinate a single um, pumpkin plant um, in my yard. And um, they, they do quite well with the, with, with the amount of bees and pollinators that are, that are present. So there's, there's a pollination time window. For successful pollination, the male and female flowers need to be open on the same day in the same general area. And the ratio of male to female flowers can influence pollination. And you can see why that's true, because that, that uh, bee must visit the, the, fee, or the male flower and pick up that pollen and take it to the female flower. And then there's, that's not the end because it's very important that after that female flower is pollinated, those pollen granules must germinate and grow in order to fertilize the ovule of the female pumpkin flower. If some of, the, of those granules don't get fertilized, the result is a lopsided pumpkin. And I'm sure all of you have seen um, this, this um, in perhaps an apple or an orange you've bought that is big, there's more pulp on one side and seeds than there are on the other side. And that's because that's uh, in not perfect pollination. It's not totally pollinated. So there's other things that can be going on um, to interrupt pollination. And those are high temperatures, too much nitrogen, water stress, disease, and planting density. And I wanna stop there and say that um, you want your your uh, pumpkin vines to be growing in an area when they're not where they're not competing with grass and weeds and other vegetable plants. Um, when those nodes are down on the ground and start to grow roots, they shouldn't have to. Uh, it's better if they don't compete for those resources in the soil. So the pollen. Let's go on. So here is um, the unpollinated female bloom. And you'll see that it's a poor, poor little um, unpollinated ovary that's going to just turn yellow, then brown, and drop off the plant. But the more important, and that means it was not pollinated and fertilized in order for that this, this ovule to grow. You also see in this picture, this little root at the, at the leaf node starting to grow. And that's, that's really important because here's a picture of 
This is that vine that grew all along the front sidewalk last, last year. <laughs> and here's an example of um, two or three things. One is that here is pumpkin, here is male flower, here is pumpkin, here is male flower, here is male flower, and here is pumpkin. And so this particular um, section of the plant also is has rooted into the ground at every node here, 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 here. And so every one of these sections it has its own um, supply of nutrients right at hand, and that's really important. If this vine were up off the ground, then all of these plants would de be dependent, say it's in a pot back here, would de be dependent on one resource location. And you can see that this kind of um, um, good growth and very uh, good pollination and fruit production is um, really helped along by the fact that every one of these leaf nodes has found a rooted position for nutrition in the soil. Also, this uh, particular mulched area is very, very thin, so these can reach down through. So rooting occurs at the leaf nodes, and question about removing competitor pumpkins, I have not found that to be the the need to be a need because each one of these, as I said, has a superstore of nutrition um, available to these developing fruits. Here's another picture taken at extension last year. Uh, this this is the group of pumpkins that they harvested, and you'll see that here is the node, and this plant is sending out multiple roots and it is just searching for this soil and will find it. And in fact, this um, plant subsequently really took off. So pests, insects and diseases. Um, a lot of people don't like, well, nobody likes um, pests that are eating your crops that you're trying to grow. Uh, it's kind of an aggravating fact of life, especially in Florida, but the main pests of Seminole pumpkins are root knot nematodes, which affect the roots, caterpillars, which affect the foliage, um, mealybugs, which affect root, roots and fruits, flea hoppers, which affect foliage, leaf footed bugs, foliage, and white flies, foliage. Um, you'll see that I have grayed out powdery mildew and gummy stem blight because I have never seen it with Seminole pumpkins. They are very resistant um, to these two, two items. And so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them. So we're gonna move on to healthy roots. Healthy roots, and this is, let's say you, you have a whole lot of plants and something that we do is that I, I want good demonstration pictures so we, Pull things up. We have a lot, so we pull things up sometimes. And this is a picture of healthy roots showing fibrous quality, and they're able to take up and carry water and nutrients that the plant needs to produce these good pumpkins. So you'll see that there's just a lot of fibrous um, qualities to these roots that um, every one of them is available to take up nutrition and water. However, if you look a little closer, this is the same picture, you will see that there are little nodes developing at certain places. And these are root knot nematode galls. And it is a collection to, of, of where the, the root knot nematodes are within the roots, um, taking their own sustenance from the roots, and they are interrupting those uh, nutrients that will be reaching the fruit above ground. So these roots can presently sustain good plant growth, but the only way to find out what's going on is to look. I wouldn't look until, until you start to sense that there is a problem. And you will see the plant start to slow down, start to have 
problems. Uh, maybe the, the, the growing tip isn't growing as fast. Um, maybe it just, it just looks like it's not happy. And this is probably the first indication of a problem below the soil. So this is a picture of a very involved root knot nematode uh, root system. Uh, like I said, there's a general lack of vigor and non-fruiting going on. The galls form on the roots infested with the nematodes. It's one of the most destructive plant parasites that you can have because it's happening underneath the soil. And a lot of times you're not thinking about that. So they can cause extensive damages and changes in the root system. And some of these organisms also cause vascular wilts and other diseases because the plant is compromised. So here's another picture of severely infested nematode roots. And you'll see that, um, you know, they look, the pictures are deceiving sometimes because it looks like this is a very deep root and really it's, it's really laying uh, very shallowly under the earth. Um, and you'll see the plant is just not doing well. And when you pull up something like this, then you need to take your clipper and clip that section out. Because if your plant is rooted at all the new nodes and is growing new, new roots as it goes, excuse me, it can support itself on the better um, parts of the plant. Nematodes over the winter time will remain in the soil and overwinter easily. And that's why you want to uh, practice good crop rotation and summer soil solarization, and also remove and dispose of any um, plant material that looks like this. Uh, you never ever want to put those in your compost pile. The next big issue that most folks have with um, Seminole pumpkins is caterpillar inf infestations. They are the major insect problem for Seminole pumpkins. The caterpillar, caterpillars appear as the weather warms up and, and the warmer and more humid and wet that the um, environment is, that's just like heaven for a caterpillar and, and good green um, vines and leaves to eat. So you wanna scout frequently and pay special attention to the newest leaves because they're green, they're tender, they're fresh. Uh, it's just like when you go out to gather your lettuce, you don't pick the old things you, for your, your meal and they would not do that either. They will pick the young and tender because they taste best. So this is a melon worm. It only feeds on cucurbits. Uh, the moth has a wingspan of one inch. It's white, slight, slightly iridescent, and in the wings centrally and edged with a dark brown band, and it has kind of a brush tail. The important part about this particular caterpillar is its life cycle. It has two to six eggs that hatch in three to four days, a larval life of 14 days, the fifth has five instars. The largest is about a little over a half an inch. The pupal state lasts nine to 10 days and one complete cycle is a month or less. And that's important because these are gonna appear and start eating on the leaves. And if you're not there to interrupt this cycle, they will eat, um, they will, they will do a lot of damage. So while you're scouting, you go out one day and let's say you haven't been out there for a couple of days. I usually scout every morning and you'll go out and scout and you'll see something like this and you'll say, I wonder what's eating my pumpkin plants. And you get busy and don't think about it too much because it doesn't look too bad. There's just that one, one leaf there. And you come back the next day and you go, oh no. <laughs> What's going on? Now it really has your attention. But let's say you didn't. You come back in maybe four days and you see a completely skeletonized leaf. 
and you need to find out what's going on. And so you look for the caterpillar or you look for the pupa. Now, of course, there's nothing going on on this leaf anymore because whatever ate it has had its meal and moved onward to the next restaurant. But if you look at the other leaves, you will find another scouting clue. And that is the appearance of frass. And I wanna say that these areas are frass. This is just some, some kind of mulch that's been shot up there inadvertently. Um, but these are, these are caterpillar droppings. And if you examine the lower leaves and see the droppings, then look at the leaves above them, at the bottom of them, uh, at the dorsal side of the leaf, and look for the eggs and the caterpillars above. You may have lifted a leaf and found this. There are five instars of these melon worms. You, the first, the first uh, integrated pest management tool you might use is, is to hand pick them. When you see them, pick them up, uh, dispose of them. Um, you'll see also, these are fifth star, and I know they're fifth star, why? Because you see this little webbing going on, they're getting ready to pupate. But what you might not have noticed is, not only are these in the fifth in star, but all of these are brand new eggs that has, have been laid. And when you're looking, you need to kind of look close and from afar and looking close, you're gonna see your, the future. The future of this leaf is right here in all these little guys who need to eat when they hatch. So after he eats, <laughs> After all of those days and five in stars, then you have the melon worm uh, beginning to pupate. And you will see this. This is a little leaf folding activity. And when they pupate, what they do is they, they start to build a web. They, they um, cover themselves. They uh, lock the front door with, with the silk. And then this, is um, a picture of, of this interrupted pupa that I opened up so you could see what it looks like inside. And you will see that the on the on this this um, pupa, here are the the stripes from the caterpillar still retained. So here's the mature melon worm pupa. Uh, again, this is an interrupted uh, picture. Open it up and you'll see that this pupa has um, turned into the beginnings of the moth. And here is the moth. You can see the, the wings and, and the head and the abdomen back here. And here is, again, the important thing is that if not controlled because of this short life cycle and all of these um, time frames within 30 days. If you don't find and remove this at the egg stage, at the caterpillar stage, at, at the um, pupa stage, then all of this starts over and this particular one caterpillar is gonna do all of these. And that's why in the earlier picture, you saw a lot of eggs because those were eggs laid by more than one female moth. So here's another interesting bug, the leaf-footed bugs versus the assassin bugs. And this is an insect ID um, uh, contest, I guess. When you see an insect on your plant, you might go, uh, your first, first instinct of a lot of new gardeners is, oh, it's a bug, it can't be a good thing. And um, you need to recognize that most of the most insects are positive insects uh, and the leaf-footed bugs versus the assassin bugs is a, is a good example. You wanna recognize the differences and with these insects, the difference between the leaf-footed bugs and the assassin bugs is that one is a pest being the leaf-footed bug 
And one is a beneficial, the assassin bug, because he goes after, after the leaf-footed bugs. So it, and other bugs too. It is a bug that likes to lay eggs on pumpkins and other cucurbits, but it's not a problem. The leaf-footed bug is not a problem because other than minor leaf damage, uh, pumpkins have a very strong outer shell and they would much rather go and bother your tomatoes, which are easier for a leaf-footed bug. So that is a, um, a vegetable that they're more dangerous for. And also um, citrus, they're a major pest of citrus. So you will see, here's the, something that's important. These are the, the nymphs of the, of the adult leaf foot bug. These are the nymphs of the assassin bug. And that's why it's very easy to confuse the two because the nymph stages look incredibly similar. So you wanna get a good ID on them before you decide um, uh, what your pest or insect strategy is. So if it's an assassin bug, you wanna let it be. If it's an adult leaf-footed bug, you might want to um, use some integrated pest management if it's a problem. So here's mealybugs. And again, we're back to those roots with the uh, root knot nematodes, which are weakened now because they can't carry um, nutrients to the plant. And mealybugs uh, attack plants that are compromised. And so you see that they're, they're little soft-bodied insects and they're covered with a white cottony or mealy wax secretion. You will see them mostly underground on the roots, but you will also see them above ground level on some old pumpkin plants, but, but near the ground. You will find them occasionally when pulling old roots. And, and I say old roots because if you are pulling old roots that are already involved, then the plant has not declined to the point where the mealybugs are going to move in as much. Um, with harvested pumpkins, and those that you bring, bring in the house and you set them on the counter uh, and you can leave them there for a long time. If you pick them up sometimes, that you brought them in and didn't know that they had mealybug eggs on them. And you will see on the blossom end that there are mealybugs and you wanna just wipe them off and um, keep an eye on it. Ladybugs are very effective on large populations of mealybugs. And neem oil can be applied per directions. Neem oil uh, is effective because it suffocates the insect on contact with its body and the insect can't breathe anymore. So here's another picture of the mealybugs. They kind of look like um, little walking pillows. And here is a picture for scale. And the next insect is white flies. They are uh, potential for only minor damage for seminal pumpkins. I have never had an issue with them. Um, the hardening pumpkin shell quickly becomes difficult for them to damage um, as as is the uh, opposite case for tomato fruits, but they will do some leaf damage. They are, and, and again, they like excess, excess um, nitrogen. And because they like um, old tomato plants, you don't wanna, or not, you don't wanna plant them near those because they will, they're kind of like both crops that they like and you're, you're aiding the population. So you also want to plant, one thing you can do is to plant border plants that attract beneficial in, insects near your pumpkin plantings. Um, marigolds, Cracker Jack is one variety, there are others. Um, and as I said, I have not had an issue with them at all. Here's the garden flea hopper. Um, I think that the, the most prevalent plant that I see them involved with a Swiss chard because they they are always there, but they are minor pests again to Seminole pumpkins. They're car common garden pests. 
They are occurring every, all year except for freezing temperatures. And they are, as some of the other insects we've talked about, they're, they have piercing sucking mouthpieces. And that is a definition of a true bug. They suck sap from the individual leaves, causing cell death. And that's why you see the whiting, white, whitish or yellowish speckling on the foliage. Um, rather than some, some, some of all pumpkin normal leaf modeling. Their parasitic the parasitic wasps are their enemies. So, and they're very small. They're very small. This is a picture that was um, uh, increased in size quite a bit. And they do, they, they hop. Beneficial insects. Now, um, there's a predatory insect called the green lynx spider. Uh, if you have never watched them before, uh, they make their webs um, on ornamental shrubs. They make their webs several places. They're incredibly interesting to watch. They will spin an egg sac and tend it, um, uh, take very good care of it. The mother watches this egg sac and if you watch it, if you watch it along, um, it's really a fantastic um, process to observe. So this green link spider has got a hold of, of a leaf-footed bug. And there are nine species of leaf-footed bugs in Florida. And they also have these sucking, piercing uh, mouth parts, and they suck nutrients from plants. They are um, pests to a lot of different crops. Um, recognition, though, is important because the leaf-footed nymphs, like the adults, look a lot like assassin bugs, and assassin bugs are beneficial. So you want to make sure you know the difference between these two um, bugs because you don't want to um, do away with your beneficial predators. So always determine an accurate ID when considering whether to use integrated pest management on any of your garden insects. So this is another beneficial insect, and this is easy to miss. This is a very small little cocoon there showing up on a pumpkin leaf, and it is in fact a solitary braconid wasp cocoon. Mm -hmm. And these are found on seminal pumpkin leaves, um, not, um, not in large numbers. I mean, we had to look for these to find them. There are over 1,900 species of braconid wasps in, in North America. And you probably are familiar with another uh, picture of a braconid wasp cocoon set. And this is, this is on a Tursa Sphinx hornworm. You know, this is the, the dreaded, one of the dreaded tomato hornworms. And you may go out to your tomato plant and you see this. And the first time you see one, uh, it's quite startling because you think, what is going on here? Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Um, should I kill it? Um, what should I do? And uh, there are different kind of hornworms. This is another one. This is the cobbler's moth hornworm. So you see this one, all the cocoons are pretty much lined up on the top. This one, for this particular hornworm, they are lined up on the sides. So there are a lot of, lot of variability to what you're going to see in the insect world. So let's talk for a minute about the braconid wasp because a lot of times people, I mean, this is, this is a picture of the wasp. Um, it doesn't look terribly different from the garden variety wasp that you might think about, but there is an exception that we'll talk about in a minute, big exception. Um, this is the process by which um, this wasp lays its eggs on the caterpillar body by the female, of course. They hatch into larva. She, she lays them inside the body. She deposits them, them under the skin. They hatch into larvae and they feed on the caterpillar's insides. When they're done feeding, they chew a hole in the skin of the caterpillar 
and squeeze through. And that's what you see in this lower left picture. Those are the larvae who have squeezed through. And then once outside, they each spin a cocoon. So these are all separate cocoons from separate eggs, separate larvas that were implanted into this hornworm. The fully spun cocoon will put will will um, pupate inside and then emerge as an adult. So, you know, when we talked about this this wasp, you know, when we think wasp, we think um, pretty big, you know, fearsome, fearsome. But this is the size of the Brocconid wasp. He is three millimeters long, or she is. And you can see she's just about as long as the date on a penny, which is not what you would expect to see when you saw this picture in the, the lower right. It looks like a garden variety wasp. So you always want to look at a picture and think about the assumptions you're making about it and you know, then look at reality for true size. So this is a very, very valuable um, predatory insect that helps you in your garden. And you may just look at him as a little, little uh, flying insect that's annoying and swatting, but you wouldn't want to do that. So here's everybody's favorite um, beneficial insect, and it's the lady beetle. <clears throat> Excuse me. They typically feed on plant pests, aphids, mealybugs, mice, mites, scale insects, white flies, and mildews, excuse me. They will eat flower nectar, water, and honeydew if prey is scarce. So they're kind of, they're good opportunists. They have a lot of different ways of surviving and they're used as a biological control insect. And of course you wanna avoid spraying chemicals that will harm them and be familiar with what the different life cycle stages look like. So here's um, some eggs, a nymph and star, some of, some of which look quite different from this. Um, there, are, there is a lot of variability between species. And here are some um, examples of various species. There are 6,000 species worldwide. So you, you know, some of these um, nymphs are very, very small. You can barely see them. So you have to, again, just your, adjust your vision. So we have talked about caterpillar pests and insect pests. And then one of the IPM um, mild posts is, is how to attract beneficials. And that, again, is through routine scouting, hand picking of caterpillars and other pests. I can't overemphasize um, directly hand picking because it is the safest and easiest um, first step of managing uh, a problem before it becomes a bigger problem. And to prune and dispose of highly infested and damaged foliage. You don't want to leave that. It is a source of nutrition for the plant, but you need to make a um, cost benefit analysis. And if, if the leaf is heavily infested or damaged, you're better off without it. Um, use of natural enemies and biological controls are safer for the people and the environment and less toxic to the non-target organisms in the environment. Because you want to think about, if you're going to use a product, you want to think about what else is currently living in your garden that would um, force your garden to decline because of missing the beneficials. Uh, also, Bt, which is a natural occurring bacteria found in soil, fresh water, and on plant surfaces. Uh, Bt products are the most commonly used microbial insecticides. It's very important to follow directions. Um, if a little bit is good, a lot is not good, you must follow the directions or else uh, you risk putting other organisms at risk. 
and you and selected natural products are horticultural oils, neem oil, and insecticidal soaps. So you see on this slide that plants that you also want to plant um, plants that attract the beneficials, and many of those are, of course, flowers, herbs, flowering herbs. Um, it just brings them to your garden and um, completes your environment, really, because what you're building is an environment. Plant diversity invites all of these beneficials to your gardens. So general maintenance practices, you see here um, two areas of um, seminal pumpkins, um, vines and the leaves are declining. Um, some of them are aging out. Some of them are um, due to the age, the vigor, the pests and the pathogens. And you kind of need to remove and dispose the badly damaged, the visible pests, the actual pest hand picking again, carefully removing um, aged, aging vines and stems and roots. If you have several areas of rooted um, pumpkin vines and some areas are not, it's okay to remove those areas that are not as long as the other areas are rooted and growing. And also the, your cultural practices of crop rotation and soil solarization. Harvesting. A lot of people say, when can I harvest my pumpkin? Well, when it's very young, you can use a stir fry, that's okay. At full size, but green with some color, you can bring it in. Uh, it can be used or it can sit on your counter until it turns, um, uh, gains its color at full size and colored. Um, if you leave them on the vine until they're orange and some of mine remain because they're growing back in places where they get they get forgotten and their surprises. But the second method is recommended because if you bring them in a little bit green, it deters scavenging by squirrels, rats, raccoons, opossums. Uh, the pumpkin will color up on your counter. Um, and again, remove those vines as they age out. Once you've removed these, those, those parts of the vines are not gonna continue to produce and to keep your records. So here's a harvesting clue. This is probably damaged by a raccoon. Uh, it happens in late July. Uh, the animals know better than we do sometimes when the ripening uh, season is and they show up right on schedule for when different crops are um, ripening. And the animals are often thirsty as well as hungry, especially during periods when it's not raining reliably. And, and, and this is part of um, attracting animals to your Florida friendly landscape. Um, they are part of the landscape. And so maybe a drink was all they really needed and you wanna provide water. Just because one pumpkin is damaged is not necessarily a reason to bring in all of the rest. Uh, you just need to, as I said, scout regularly and kind of keep a handle on what's going on. So moving from the garden to the table, what happens on the counter and in the kitchen? Um, pumpkins are highly nutritious. They are low calorie, low fat, low sugar, low sodium, what's not to like, um, high in vitamin A, high in fiber, and contain vitamin C, iron, and calcium. So when you uh, line them up next to uh, a lot of other vegetables, there is a lot of nutrition available in a vegetable that can doesn't, doesn't require storage for a long time and can sit on your counter and you can use them as you wish on your schedule. So there are shelf lives of many ways. Um, as I said, this is a picture up in the upper right of of a pumpkin that was stored on the on the counter for 10 or 12 months. Now that's that's way past its peak, but you can see that um, it's not rotting. It's drying, but it's not rotting, and the seeds within it are still viable. So you want to watch for those mealybugs that appear on the blossom end, as we already discussed. You want to discard if rot becomes evident, um, and 
there are other storage methods. Um, this is from last uh, two years ago now almost. This is some um, uh, pumpkin cubes that I pressure can. You never ever can puree pumpkin. Um, USDA uh, advises against it. There is no safe, safe recipe um, to do that. It is only safe to pressure can in cubes. So this is roasted seminal pumpkin. It takes about seven minutes to microwave a seminal pumpkin with the seeds removed. Uh, you want to check it for fork tender. And using the microwave instead of a heated oven saves you electricity and reduces heat in your home. This is a savory choice. Uh, it was uh, offered at a holiday meal with as a soup course. It was the soup course followed, followed by the vegetable course. Um, a lot of fun. You can have a lot of fun with, with uh, most of uh, everything that you grow. Pumpkin Day in the Kitchen, this is a freezer pr product, um, uh, baked a, a number of pumpkins at the same time whole. Um, I didn't need any more seeds, um, but when it's, um, when it's baked, uh, you cool it, process the pulp until it's smooth and put them in freezer bags and one bag is enough for pumpkin muffins and two bags are enough for pumpkin pie. So that's, um, it would be 17 ounces of pumpkin. Seminole pumpkin muffins. Uh, there are creative ways to use pumpkin in many of the recipes that you already have. Um, this can be a banana muffin recipe transformed. Uh, there are a lot of different changes that you can use to suit your own baking style. And um, you know, this one with the addition of oatmeal for extra fiber, even though pumpkin already has a good deal of fiber in it. And the seeds. Uh, I know um, a lot of families that their favorite part of the Seminole pumpkin is roasting the seeds um, with a little salt. And all you have to do is wash them, remove the pulp, dry them in a, in a ventilated area, and to roast them, you soak in the water before oven roasting, which makes them crisper. And this is my favorite Seminole pumpkin pies. I waited a long time to be able to do this. It was the first recipe I wanted to try. Uh, it makes a superior pumpkin pie. Um, it is uh, a little more moist than the pump pumpkin puree that you buy at the supermarket, but you can reduce that a little bit or extend the baking time and they turned out super. Pressure canning Seminole pumpkin is the only USDA approved pressure canner method. Never attempt to pressure can the puree, as I said. And capturing all the goodness. Um, uh, I'm a child of a depression, a depression era mother. And you know we never wasted anything. So the inside seeds and the pulp can be separated for use. Uh, most folks throw this part away. If you use this portion of the pumpkin, <laughs> then the only portion of the pumpkin you're throwing away to the compost is the stem and the outside peels. So um, think about that and put the pulp with any residual seeds through a sieve and then cook the remaining product uses pulp or filter again for juice. It makes lovely juice. Finishing up the season, compost your leftovers. Here's all the peels. Um, the best case scenario is that you only have peels left if you've used everything else of the pumpkin for food. Um, the peels are good compost materials <coughs> containing nutrients returned to the soil. Errant seeds also create new plants for the next season coming up in the compost um, pile as we saw earlier. And you will wanna bury the peels at a depth to deter animals from digging them up right away. Finally finished, uh, finishing with keeping records. These are some of the kinds of records that you can keep for any of your planning any of your planting areas, 
the cultivars, the locations, the source, the source of the seed for the plant. So that's very important. Cost of materials, dates planted, harvested, yields, the weather. Um, pictures are so um, useful in lessons learned. And then your future plans. So you want to have some kind of a resource where you where you make these notes for yourself, where they're combined um, in one little booklet that you can pick up when you need it. So here is my record, my production record for for the five months, almost six months, from August twenty one to January twenty two. And this is this is the vegetable garden perimeter vine, and also that front front house front and side beds, which were the surprise plants. Total number of pumpkins were sixty, uh, one hundred and twenty pounds of pumpkins. That's a lot of pumpkins. I was very busy. Um, the highest weight was um, over two and a half pounds. Total pints can was forty six. Um, packets frozen was twelve. 24 ounce jars of juice canned was six on the counter, somewhere between two and 24, you know, when you're busy, who's counting? And um, we have them for dinner a lot. These are the selected resources.